Namaste and welcome to Pods by PEI, a policy discussion series brought to you by Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. I am Kushi Hang, and in today's episode, PEI colleague Ashley Shrestha is in conversation with economist Chitis Dahal on Nepal's public debt dilemma, opportunities, and challenges. Chitis is an economist at South Asia Watch on Trade, Economics, and Environment with key interests in international trade, development economics, and econometrics. Ashlesh and Chitis discuss Nepal's public debt, exploring its origins, implications, and current scenario, beginning with an examination of the concept of public debt itself and historical examples worldwide. They unravel the rising concerns surrounding Nepal's per capita debt. Through an analysis of various indicators and drivers behind the recent surge in public debt, they navigate the intricate landscape of debt financing and its repercussions on the Nepali economy and society. From understanding key lenders to dissecting the explicit and implicit costs associated with debt servicing, they shed light on the multifaceted nature of this economic phenomenon. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Namaste, I'm Asli Shrestha. Namaste, I am Chitiz Dahal. Welcome, Chitiz, uh, to Pods by PI. We are very glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Asli. I really like the environment here. Very warm and cozy studio. So what are your current engagements? Which major areas of interest are you researching on? So as I said, we do research on various economic themes. Right now, we just finished a research on the state of public debt in Nepal, which is the topic of today. And we are also engaged in research around various related themes, such as the development finance assessment of Nepal. And we do a lot of studies about the international trade of Nepal. So basically, I'm engaged in those kind of stuff right now. Rightly pointed out. Today's discussion will be on uh, Nepal's public debt scenario. But before going into the Nepalese context, would you like to introduce the concept of public debt? Why and how do governments access public debt? Can you slightly trace it in uh, economic history when public debt generally started uh, or states generally started to access debts from sources beyond their budget? And if there are any interesting examples, you can also list them. Thanks, Asliz. I think that's a great place to start our podcast with. Uh, let's start with the idea of public debt. We know that government assumes various expenditure responsibilities. For instance, government spends on various areas like education, health, social security, defense, infrastructure building like road building and other infrastructure. And the government also has the authority to raise taxes and other revenues. And they also receive uh, grants from abroad. So all this makes up the revenue of the government. So the government has expenditure responsibilities and the government has revenue collection. So in some cases, the revenue collection is used to finance government expenditure. But it is sometimes the case that the revenue that government raises is not adequate to fund government expenditure. So in those cases, the government borrows funds to finance its resource gap. So, for instance, in a year, if the government borrows money to finance its resource gap, that will be called the fiscal deficit of that particular year, which is equivalent to the public debt that the country accumulates in that particular year. And when these uh, deficit adds up, that is the public debt stock of the country. Now, regarding the next question about how do government access these funds? The government basically access these funds through borrowing money from the public. So they issue what is known as bonds. It, it is basically government going up to the public and requesting a portion of their savings in return for interest rate or discount rate. So when the bond is used in the context of uh, mobilizing domestic savings it is it is the domestic bonds but sometimes the government also issue bonds in foreign currencies and these are known as international sovereign bonds and in the case of countries like nepal we also borrow from other bilateral sources uh, from other countries and we also borrow from 
the multilateral sources like uh, the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. So all of these um, uh, con con constitute the uh, public debt of the country. And now um, the history of uh, public debt, I think it goes a long way back. The United States has had public debt since its inception. I was reading somewhere that during its revolutionary war, it incurred a debt of around $75 million dollar. Uh, borrowed from uh, domestic investors and also from the French government uh, to buy war materials. And I also read an article uh, by Paul Krugman which says that the United Kingdom has been incurring debt. It has not been debt-free since at least 1692. So what I'm trying to hint at is public debt is not always bad. The governments also use public debt to enhance growth and welfare. We'll come to that uh, portion later on. But before that, I would like you to clarify another concept, primarily the indicators of debt. So you already mentioned about the total debt stock of a country. But beyond that, we have another important indicator, which is per capita debt. And in general, for listeners who do not follow these kind of indicators in a regular manner, how should they interpret this indicator. Yes, you are right, Asli. Uh, the per capita debt is an indicator that I have seen uh, thrown around a lot in Nepal's uh, media uh, discussions. Strictly in the sense of economic analysis, I don't think per capita debt is a very useful indicator because it does not indicate how big or how small the debt is relative to the economic output of the country. Furthermore, the indicator may also be somewhat misleading. So I have met some people who think that the, the public debt, uh, the per capita debt, the people may be compelled to go into their bank accounts and uh, pay off uh, the, the debt to get rid of the public debt, which is not true. And the name of the indicator, it makes it seems like it's a debt owed by the public but in fact, it is a debt owed by the government to the public. So it, it could be somewhat misleading. And there are various other useful indicators that provide a better overview of the debt situation. You mentioned there are other indicators, right? One of them uh, most popularly used maybe is a debt to GDP ratio. What other indicators can be used to understand the context of debt in a country? Thanks, Asli. That's a great question. So I think it may be practical to list these uh, debt indicators into two broad pillars. So uh, whenever we use debt indicator, it might be useful to first assess the magnitude of the debt. So how we do it, we use the indicators which provides indication as to how big the public debt is in, in relation to the economic activity or other economic feature of the country. For instance, as you pointed out, debt to GDP does that. It uh, points out how big the debt is in relative to the total economic output of the country. That's why it's one of the mostly used indicator and it, it also allows for uh, cross-country comparison among different countries. And in that category, another indicator is um, uh, public uh, debt to revenue ratio expressed as public debt as a percent of revenue, indicates uh, the capacity of the government to fund uh, its debt through its uh, revenue collection. And uh, the other category of public debt indicator is what may be called uh, the debt financing indicators. Uh, these could also be called as uh, debt sustainability indicators because what debt sustainability boils down to is the ability of country to comfortably service its debt. And uh, some of the indicators used in this category are the common indicators like debt to export, debt to revenue, debt servicing to GDP, interest uh, attracted by public debt to GDP, uh, and uh, many other indicators. So uh, differentiate between uh, domestic debt and external debt because sometimes uh, they have uh, different interest rates and they have different conditions. So we also try to look into 
on how vulnerable or how sustainable the stock of external data is. So we also use um, uh, the indicators we talked about previously, but focusing solely on external debt. So uh, indicators like external debt to GDP, um, external debt servicing to uh, GDP, external debt servicing to revenue, external debt service to exports, because uh, in most of the countries, exports is what earns foreign currency to finance this deficit. Uh, uh, these are the commonly used indicators to assess the debt state of the country. So you did point out about debt sustainability. I have a question on that. But before that, uh, let's talk about the Nepali context of public debt. In the recent decade, public debt has been a very widely discussed topic in Nepal specifically. Uh, maybe discuss about when public debt started in Nepal and how has it transitioned Nepal officially embarked on its journey of um, issuing bonds and getting uh, foreign loans uh, through uh, an act which was endorsed in, I think, uh, 1960, 1960, somewhere in the vicinity of 1960, when it endorsed its first uh, public debt act, which was called the Rastriya Reed Ayn Duyazar Satra. So I think that paved the way for uh, the collection of um, uh, public debt for Nepal. And uh, I had read in a journal paper that Nepal started collecting domestic debt since 1962, so which is a couple of years after the promulgation of that act, and uh, foreign loans since uh, 1993. And Nepal's first creditors of foreign loans were the USSR and the United Kingdom. And we have come a long way from that now. So if we look at the history of Nepal's uh, public debt accumulation, we see that there was a major spike in uh, public debt uh, around the 80s and 90s. And then we saw a uh, sudden downturn. And then we have seen another rapid debt accumulation in the last decade or so. Yeah, as you mentioned the debt accumulation has been quite rapid. The total debt has reached 2.38 uh, trillion in last fiscal quarter, which is 44% of our GDP. And to add to that, in the last five years, our public debt has increased by around 1.3 trillion um, Nepali rupees, right? And if you go further, before the 2015 earthquake, our a public debt was only 540 billion uh, Nepali rupees, right? So why has the debt grown so rapidly? What are the major structural issues or what are the major projects that have led to Nepali government accumulating so much debt in so short time? So first we need to note there have been two big crises faced by Nepal in this period of rapid uh, public debt accumulation. So firstly, we had a, a devastating earthquake in 2015, necessitated a huge amount of uh, public expenditure uh, for the reconstruction and recovery purposes. So that uh, necessitated government uh, uh, borrowing to finance these um, expenditures. And as we all know, we also witnessed um, the devastating pandemic in the form of uh, COVID-19, which caused uh, huge losses of lives and health, which uh, required um, a massive uh, form of government response in the form of um, uh, fiscal stimulus, in the form of concessional loans uh, to keep business afloat, in the form of subsidized vaccines, in the form of subsidized health care. These are instances where government had to respond and it responded. The public debt accumulation through these expenditure is justified, but they don't tell the whole story. There are other structural factors that have also contributed to our rapid accumulation of public debt. I would like to briefly discuss upon them. So the first one is somewhat of a paradox. After the promulgation of our new constitution, after the elections, when we developed our current development plan, the 15th Periodic Development Plan, there was a lot of aspiration from the people. So 
we had a very ambitious plan laid out. For instance, uh, the uh, the GDP growth target was set around 10.1% uh, annual GDP growth uh, target. And to achieve these, uh, the plan envisaged that a significant portion of uh, that would be achieved through increasing government expenditure, somewhere like 44% of GDP. And the political parties were also in a lot of uh, pressure to deliver uh, since people had a lot of aspirations after suffering through uh, the long period of insurgency, after suffering through the devastating earthquake, people also had huge aspirations with the, the government. And as we know that the development plan also gives the basis for formulating the annual budget. So what happened was each government after the election, they uh, presented a very inflated budget and uh, the, the expenditure um, allocated was also huge. Having government expenditure uh, for growth is not bad, but at the same time, our um, uh, public expenditure institutions had many issues. Uh, we had issues like project selection. We had issues of uh, uh, issues such as we couldn't finish projects in time. We had many wasteful expenditure, and then the capital expenditure, which is the productive. Uh, expenditure is usually way short of the target, so that contributed to increased expenditure, uh, but without the necessary returns needed to justify these um, massive expenditure. So the next thing I want to discuss is uh, how increased expenditure also coincides with our implementation of federalism. So uh, there have been some flaws in the implementation of federalism, which has likely prevented uh, uh, the results we had expected from the new form of governance. For instance, uh, the institutions in subnational governments, they lack capacity to make laws, they lack capacity to spend uh, properly, and they have a very small own source revenue sources, most of these subnational governments. And the other issue is that while the constitution provides the subnational governments with exclusive and concurrent powers and authorities, still in many areas it is not clear what powers, what specific powers these subnational governments have. So all these have contributed to suboptimal implementation of federalism, the result being the rise in uh, recurrent expenditure without the uh, expected return. And I want to talk about how rise in uh, social security expenditure has also been contributing to our increased expenditure, which contributes to public debt accumulation. So if we look at the data in uh, fiscal year 2015-16, our total so social security expenditure was uh, somewhere in the vicinity of Nepalese rupees 50 billion, which has now gone up somewhat uh, close to 250 billion rupees. So that's a huge rise and huge portion of this social security expenditure is in the form of social security. So there has been a huge rise in the uh, social allowances. I mean, there is nothing wrong with maintaining certain level of social welfare. But what is problematic is that these social um, allowances are also criticized for having electoral motivations. There have been media accounts of this. There have been other debates that uh, the political parties uh, have often used these allowances as tool to gather votes. For instance, uh, in a, in a run-up to the recent election, if you look at the manifestos, manifestos of major political parties, uh, the, both of the major political parties, they talk about uh, making the old age pension more generous by uh, reducing the qualification age or by increasing the size of the transfer. So when uh, the social security allowances are used for political purposes, then that, that, uh, that risks um, increasing the expenditure half as early. And this has also added, increased our government expenditure and added to our public debt stock. And then the next thing I want to talk about is how the changing official development assistant landscape has also contributed to our uh, public debt uh, accumulation. So if we look into our official development assistant data, what we see is until fiscal year 2017-18, grants 
outspaced um, loans in our official development or sustained receipts. In its peak in 2013-14, I think grants composed about 68% of total official development assistance receipts compared to the rest for the loans and technical assistance. But after the loans exceeded the grants in fiscal year 2017-18, loans constitute a predominant share of our official development assistance receipts. Loans constitute roughly about 70% of our official development assistance receipts, with grants uh, occupying around 20%, and the rest being the technical assistance. So these changing official development assistance landscape, where we rely more on loans, has also contributed to uh, the accumulation of public debt. I would also like to talk about how our weak institutional structure also contributes to uh, the increased public debt accumulation. For instance, uh, we have um, uh, major institutional issues such as uh, weakness in project selection. Uh, there are there is um, there are major issues of uh, project cost overruns, time overruns, and. Um, we also have um, institutional issues in uh, in uh, realizing the the concessional foreign assistance that is usually targeted in the start of the fiscal year for instance we get only about 50% of foreign assistance than what was targeted in the budget so institutional issues such as inability to fulfill the procurement and other standards, inability to conduct timely agreements, and other issues contribute to uh, these scenarios. We have a serious um, issue in mobilizing capital expenditure. They are usually way short of uh, their targeted amount. And even the quality is low because mostly the capital expenditure is spent only towards the end of the fiscal year uh, and the quality suffers. These institutional issues have also contributed to increased expenditure but a low return on these expenditures. And lastly, while our revenue structure looks very superior on the surface, we have uh, one of the highest revenue to, to GDP ratio uh, if you compare it to other peer countries. However, it hides an unsustainable base. Our revenue structure, our taxation structure is heavily dependent on imports. Around uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent of our total tax receipts are collected through taxes on, on imports. And even uh, in the inland um, uh, taxation structure, only a quarter of our inland tax receipts is obtained through income taxes and the rest is through indirect taxation. So these kind of revenue structure sometimes has adverse impact on the growth prospects. And uh, there is ample scope for expansion of the tax base. So this narrow revenue band has also contributed to the public debt issue. There was a very comprehensive answer and I think the following questions will be based on the points you've made out in this answer. Could you maybe break down the composition of public debt that Nepal currently has in terms of internal and external debt and maybe donor-wise distribution of external debt and what kind of projects they have, the donors have been funding? Sure. The governments primarily borrow funds through what is what are known as treasury bonds or treasury bills. So in the case of uh, Nepal, the government borrows um, domestic debt through the issuance of the short-term treasury bills and the long-term treasury bonds. The treasury bills mature within a year and some have their maturity as low as 28 days. Um, so the government... Uh, issues these short-term treasury bills and they constitute about uh, roughly 40% of uh, Nepal's total domestic debt uh, as was um, as per the data of the last fiscal year. And the government also raises debt in the form of uh, medium to long-term uh, development bonds, the treasury bonds, and uh, the development bond constitutes about 59% uh, of Nepal's um, total public 
debt uh, holding. And there are other different, um, uh, such as the citizen saving bonds, the foreign employment bonds, but they occupy a very small share of Nepal's to, uh, treasury bond at the moment. Uh, in terms of um, our uh, domestic debt instruments, uh, these uh, domestic uh, debt instruments are predominantly owned by the public through their ownership by commercial banks. So the commercial banks are the largest investors in these domestic debt instruments. I think a very small share of the treasury bills is owned by Nepal Rastra Bank, the central bank, which is sometimes referred to as the intra-governmental holdings. But it's a very small share of Nepal's total domestic um, debt. Now, in terms of external debt, we do not uh, borrow through the swings of foreign currency denominated bonds. So our um, foreign borrowing is entirely in the form of borrowing from bilateral partners, the other donor countries, and borrowings from multilateral institutions like ADB and the World Bank. And in terms of their composition, the borrowings from multilateral institutions has seen a rising trend. And as of last fiscal year, borrowings from the multilateral institutions accounted for almost 88% of Nepal's total external debt stock. And even among the multilateral institutions, two institutions, World Bank and the ADB, account for about 80% of Nepal's total external debt stock. World Bank or the IDA accounts for roughly 50% of Nepal's total external debt stock. And the Asian Development Bank accounts for roughly 30% of Nepal's total external debt stock. And in terms of our bilateral external debt, which accounts for about 12% of our total external debt stock, um, Japan, India and China are the largest creditors. Japan's share in our total external debt is roughly 5% of our total external debt. China, India accounts for about 3.5% of Nepal's total external debt, and China accounts for similar 3.4% of Nepal's total debt stock. So what I also want to mention is that our external debt is largely of a concessional nature which means we borrow for under conditions which have low interest rates and a longer maturity period, which means they do not prove to be a burden in terms of our debt financing. Okay, no, you just um, transitioned into my next question. So I was wondering uh, regarding the costs of public debt, right? So uh, you... Uh, previously mentioned about uh, debt servicing costs. And when it comes to the interest rate that various different types of instruments have, which kinds of loans are favorable for Nepal? You already mentioned about the concessional loans. Apart from that, what kind of loans are more favorable for the Nepali government? And given that public debt uh, servicing costs have risen in the past few years and uh, we can see that in the budget allocation for de debt servicing uh, in the last budget was around 18% of the total budget, right? So given these rising costs, what kind of loans are more favorable for the Nepali government? That's a great question, Aslis. And uh, you have rightly pointed out that uh, Nepal's uh, debt servicing uh, cost has seen a rapid rise. I think which is I think which I think is one of the most concerning thing about our public debt scenario in in the fiscal year 2021-22 I think our debt financing cost as a share of GDP was about 2.5% but uh, in the last fiscal year it jumped to about 4.1% of GDP which is a huge figure for a country like Nepal, which has a relatively low share of its budget uh, directed towards um, the development expenditure. So when the debt servicing is that high, it takes away the valuable resources that could have been spent on the 
uh, development expenditure and other productive forms of expenditure. So having said that, the debt servicing burden has primarily come through our domestic uh, borrowings because um, we are paying extremely high interest rates on our domestic um, treasury bills and bonds. For instance, if I remember the figures correctly, the interest rates on the average interest rate on the treasury bills in the fiscal year 2020-21 was about 2.5%. But the average interest rate on the same bills in 2021-22 climbed to about 5.8%. And in 2022-23, it jumped further to about 7.8%. And we saw similar trends in terms of the average interest rate incurred by the development bonds as well. So in terms of the aggregate interest rates, the aggregate interest rate on our domestic debt was about 4.9% in 2020-21, but then it jumped to about 8% in 2021-22, and it jumped to uh, 9% in 2021, 2022-23. So these high interest rates is what is driving up uh, the uh, debt financing cost. Gone down, so we are back to borrowing at a much um, lower interest rate. So these, what this means is in a couple of years, we can expect that the interest rates and domestic uh, debts will go down. However, the, the domestic debt instruments that were borrowed in the past have still are yet to fully mature. So we will still be witnessing um, higher debt financing costs for at least uh, one more fiscal year or two. So the, uh, the debt financing costs um, incurred through domestic borrowing has been a primary issue here. And regarding your question about... Uh, what kind of loan instrument or what kind of debt instrument is more favorable to country like ours? The answer is it depends. The usual answer by the economists. So in terms of interest rates, it is correct that the long-term concessional loans that we get from donors and the multilateral institutions are much more affordable. And we do have some fiscal space to get more of those loans as well. Our external debt to GDP stock is around 21-22% of GDP currently. And the government had recently introduced um, a public debt management act where the ceiling put on the external debt is at around one third of GDP. So we still have more room for getting these foreign loans. But if we look into the examples of other countries, it is because of the external debt that the countries usually face um, more trouble, at least in the recent history. The example of Sri Lanka is fresh in our mind because the major brunt of the debt distress faced by Sri Lanka relates to its external debt. So as long as we can obtain the concessional loans, like the loans we are receiving now, I think we... Um, we can increase our stock of uh, external loans. But I, I think we'll discuss it later. In the current situation, domestic debt is um, more expensive to service, but we have more control over the servicing of uh, domestic debt. Rightly pointed out that maybe the foreign loans or ODAs are more cheaper because of the interest rate and the time given for the servicing, right? But in the context of Nepal, as you said, the internal debt has been rising quite rapidly in the recent years. And will this not have an effect on the economy, given that there's a possibility of crowding out private investments? Yes, that's a great question. So one of the adverse impacts of high level of domestic debt is definitely the crowding out of uh, private investment because the government and the private sector when they compete for the for the domestic public saving 
the interest rates may go up and if the if the government borrows in high amounts then relatively less public saving is available for for the private sector and they might they might have to pay much higher interest rates for their borrowings uh, i mean um, there might have been some impacts in the form of higher interest rates and such but i don't think it has been an extremely adverse impact what i am basing my answer is uh, based on the data that nepal's credit to the private sector it's uh, one of the highest in the region uh, i think it's uh, the credit to the private sector is about hundred uh, percent of GDP, or even more than that, which is significantly higher than of other regional peer countries like India and other countries. Until the last uh, couple of fiscal years, uh, Nepal uh, fiscal year, Nepal's uh, credit to the private sector was growing at an extremely rapid uh, pace, which suggests that uh, perhaps there was no crowding out of private investment. Uh, it's another question as to what the, that excessive amount of credit to the private sector contributed to the economy. But I don't think we have yet seen a significant impact on the crowding out of private sector. And in terms of your question about what has been the impact of this uh, rapid accumulation of public debt on the economy and people, I think uh, until now we have largely been insulated from the impact of uh, public debt uh, accumulation. However, if we keep on accumulating uh, public debt at this pace uh, uh, without um, delivering uh, growth, then um, then we might uh, be veering towards unsustainable path of debt accumulation, which will have uh, problems. So let's just, let's just take a very quick uh, uh, walk down a very hypothetical lane. So let's say we enter into one of those situations. So what happens is, let's say we, our debt servicing is so large that it's a, a significant chunk of our government expenditure. So what can the government do in that situation? I think the government will have a couple of options. It could uh, raise taxes to increase its revenue. But as we know that it's not always the optimal um, option because uh, raising taxes means less disposable income for the residents and uh, less profit for the corporations, which uh, may then lead to low investment in the economy and the companies cutting down on jobs, which will create unemployment. So, and the individuals cutting down on their expense will create a state of low aggregate demand, and this may fuel economic problems. And uh, raising taxes is not always politically feasible. So the government may have a hard time doing that. So the other option that government could uh, choose is cutting down on expenditure. And uh, that's not always a pleasant um, option because um, uh, the, the expenditure of government in education, in the health sector, in the form of subsidies, uh, they play a very crucial role in uh, uh, maintaining the economic welfare of the country. So that will also have a significant impact on the welfare of the population. And let's say the government um, uh, becomes uh, somewhat smart and chooses uh, to finance its uh, public deficit through getting the central bank uh, to buy its um, public debt. Theoretically, there is no problem because uh, the interest rates on the public debt that is paid to the central bank will once again come back to the coffers of the government. So what can happen is uh, that will be akin to printing money and that could result in extremely high inflation rates. So if we embark down on this path of unsustainable accumulation, we will see these unpleasant um, impacts um, uh, on the economy and people. But I think until now, we are largely insulated from the impact of uh, this um, rapidly accumulating public debt. Okay, you've painted a very interesting picture, but hopefully we don't reach that exactly. scenario. I'm, exactly. I, I think we are nowhere near that situation. We are in a, a com com comfortable zone when it comes to public debt accumulation. The only concern is that it has been accumulating at a very rapid pace. And even 
different assessment um, they say that uh, nepal's uh, uh, public debt to gdp may peak at around 50% of gdp in 2025-26 and even nepal government's medium term debt framework it uh, targets um, the medium term debt to gdp at 50% so the picture what i have painted we will not reach that situation it's just to paint an example of what the real impact of uh, debt distress looks to the economy and people but uh, debt public debt can have a very positive impact on the economy and sound policies i hope the sound policies will prevail and we will not reach that stage okay uh, in your previous answers you did uh make certain comparisons with india and sri lanka regarding the debt conditions or the debt distress so i'd l- like to ask you another question regarding the debt to gdp ratio of various countries in the south asian region in the south asian region nepal is as the second lowest public debt only behind bangladesh and we can see india Maldives, Sri Lanka have quite a higher uh, debt to GDP ratio. But in general because of the size of the economies in the uh, stature of the economies this indicator may not be comparable, right? So what are the factors that people should look into before making judgments regarding the debt to GDP ratio? Uh, in the context of nepal 50% may be higher but in the context of india maybe that threshold is much higher because of their economic capacity or or what factors should we look into as you have rightly pointed out that debt to gdp while a good indicator may not always be a, a precise indicator of the label of um, debt sustainability for instance um, Um, a book um, by Reinhardt and Rogoff, Rogoff it points out that um, the defaults have occurred at a much lower debt to GDP level of 40% of gross national income. So defaults do occur at a very low level of uh, debt to GDP as well. And uh, as you have pointed out that we need to look into the various factors facets of public debt to get an idea of the sustainability of uh, public debt and uh, the recent examples also show that uh, debt to gdp may not always indicate the level of sustainability of debt what i am hinting at is for instance the, the advanced countries like japan in the us they have a really high debt to gdp ratio but they have so far been successful in servicing their debt without uh, creating much um, problem for the economy and uh, i think uh, uh, a couple of factors um, play a crucial role in um, uh, making the, uh, the debt sustainable so i think the first observation is that um, the uh, debt to gdp the debt repayment capacity it is increasing in gdp so what i mean by that is the value of uh, debt to gdp that an economy can service is higher for countries at a higher level of output so for instance say two countries have similar debt to gdp but it appears that country with higher level of gdp is more comfortable servicing the same debt to gdp ratio so that is one factor and the other factor is that we see that uh, the the, the uh, developing country at higher income level and the advanced countries they can borrow at a much lower rate uh, because of their deep uh, financial institutions and also because of the perception that uh, the bonds they offer are safe assets so they incur a very low interest rate on their public debt which means that they can service their public debt even at a higher level of debt to gdp so let me present you a statistics here so i was uh, going through the uh, public debt state of the united states and i saw that their uh, 
debt uh, financing expenditure was about 16% of their total government expenditure, which is slightly lower than what Nepal has been uh, paying this fiscal year. Nepal's uh, debt financing expenditure as a share of its total government expenditure for this fiscal year is projected at around 17.5% of GDP. But Nepal's uh, debt to GDP ratio is much lower than that of the United States. So the interest rates also play a role. And finally, the institutions matter. So the countries with the better public finance institutions, they have um, better capacity to collect taxes, they have ample uh, avenues for enhancing their revenue, and they are better equipped to plan their government expenditure. So all of these factors also play a role in the sustainability of public debt. However, having said that, Nepal looks comfortable compared to most of its regional peers at this state. As you pointed out, Bangladesh has a slightly lower public debt to GDP ratio. And India has a much higher public debt to GDP ratio than Nepal, but it it is not in a state of debt distress. But apart from these two neighbors, other Sark neighbors are witnessing debt distress in different forms. The example of Sri Lanka is fresh in all of our minds. Likewise, Pakistan, while it has not defaulted on its loan, is still struggling with its uh, foreign loans. At one point, it had only uh, the foreign exchange reserve uh, of um, equivalent uh, to service one month of imports. And it is undergoing negotiations with IMF uh, to access funds to manage its external debt situation. In the case of uh, Bhutan, Bhutan has been categorized as country with the moderate risk of debt distress by the World Bank IMF Debt Sustainability Assessment. In the case of Bhutan, we see that much of its debt is in the form of external debt in hydropower investment, mostly owned by India. Maldives is also has some form of debt distress, as we see from the same assessment. It has a significant amount of its debt in the form of external commercial borrowing. So that has also played a role in debt distress. So since you mentioned that interest rates are primarily favorable for OECD or developed nations because of their capacity to pay. But in the other sense, in the sort of development and in wholesome development of the world economy, shouldn't low, least developed countries or developing nations get a more favorable instead of the high income countries who can pay at a higher rate, right? Why do you think this scenario. Yes, you are right, Aslis. And that is actually what happens. The low-income countries get the most favorable loan con- terms and conditions. For instance, as an LDC, when we borrow from the World Bank, we no interest um, on their loans. We only pay uh, service uh, fees and commitment charges. And in the case of ADB as well, we only pay about 1 to 1.5% on the loans we procure. So we do get concessional loans as LDC, but the funds they provide is also scarce. So it is not always the case that we get the amount of concessional loan that is required to finance our expenditure needs. So in those cases, once countries climb up the income ladder and they have some sort of credit rating, they go to the commercial funds. They issue international sovereign bonds, which are bonds denominated in foreign currency. So they try to raise the savings of the foreign residents. So in that case, these are commercial loans. So so these loans, the interest rate is determined through the market mechanism. So in that case, given their subpar credit ratings, they face a higher interest rate than do the other advanced um, countries. And these are usually shorter 
duration and then the concessional loans provided by organizations like ADB and World Bank. So higher interest rate and shorter maturity means they impose additional debt financing burden. So were these the primary reason that uh, Sri Lanka had to default on their debt stock? Yes, Aslis, I think it was one of the different factors contributed to Sri Lanka's uh, default, but this was definitely one of the reasons. How is Nepal's situation different from Sri Lanka's? Because we know that during the crisis in Sri Lanka, various steps were taken by the central bank and our government, and some would say that those steps were very rash given uh, Nepal's economic condition uh, and which led to the reduction of the import-based revenue specifically. So did Nepal have to panic because Sri Lanka went into a crisis? Yes, the measures taken by our central bank, which was the measure related to import restriction. So we implemented uh, some import restriction measures like cash reserve requirement, and we also imposed ban on some imports. And I don't know how much the example of Sri Lanka played a part in the implementation of those policies. They may have been a catalyzing factor, but uh, those policies were put in place against the backdrop of a rapidly declining foreign reserve that we saw over the period of few months. So first that. Now let's talk about before comparing Nepal's situation with Sri Lanka, let me first briefly paint a picture of what may have led to Sri Lanka's debt defaulting and debt distress. So Sri Lanka, as we, we hear in Nepal, in South Asia, we take Sri Lanka as an example of uh, economic growth, of uh, development. It, it has a superior income per capita and it achieved uh, a significant progress in its human development despite its long civil war period. However, if we look closely into uh, its statistics, we see that uh, along with the increasing growth and development, that growth and development did not translate into an increased uh, revenue collection for Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka had a revenue of around 17.5% of GDP in 2005, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Then it actually slid down to around 13.5% of GDP in 2018. And even when the situation was dire, even when the debt was accumulating very rapidly, Sri Lanka took a very counterintuitive approach. It, ha it had just finished elections and it had made election pledges. So to fulfill the election pledges, Sri Lanka actually took a tax cut in 2019, which further eroded its uh, tax-to-GDP ratio. So after 2019, its tax-to-GDP ratio was below 10%, around 8 to 9%. The inability to improve uh, the tax structure, the tax collection, and over-reliance on the foreign commercial loans, which happen to be the politically palatable option. So uh, Sri Lanka chose the option of uh, borrowing uh, uh, foreign loans to finance its deficit. So that factor contributed to Sri Lanka's default. But its default was also brought about by its uh, policy mistakes in a couple of other fronts. For instance, it banned, in an effort to promote organic um, agriculture, it banned the import of uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And the impact was that the domestic production declined, which means that uh, the export of uh, food and agricultural products also declined, low export revenue in an economy which is already facing foreign exchange crisis. So that also compounded to its debt problems. And when all of this was happening, the tourist inflows, which uh, constitute a significant portion of Sri Lanka's uh, foreign exchange re revenue was decimated by COVID-19. 
So all of this meant that Sri Lanka seriously lacked foreign exchange reserve to finance its growing external debt service. And as a result of all of these, uh, Sri Lanka had to default on its loan. So now, extending this analysis, we can see how Nepal's uh, situation may be different from Sri Lanka's. First of all, we have a much superior tax and revenue collection, although I did say before that it is uh, somewhat narrow and heavily based on import uh, structure. Notwithstanding that, Nepal's revenue to GDP is one of the best in the region. So that is different than Sri Lanka's case. And we have zero commercial foreign loans. So all of our external loans are based on low interest rates and longer maturity period. So our debt servicing obligation on external debt is rather low. And we have a comfortable foreign exchange reserve as well, which means we don't have to worry about not being able to service our external debt. And finally, Sri Lanka and Nepal also differs in their source of foreign exchange earning. Sri Lanka is more reliant on their export earnings and tourist inflows, whereas in the case of Nepal, it is heavily based on remittance inflows, which have been very robust over the years. So that's how we differ from Sri Lanka in terms of our different vulnerabilities to debt. A very interesting analysis here uh, because we've mentioned about uh, debt sustainability again and again. And uh, like you pointed out in the case of Nepal, the World Bank and IMF debt sustainability analysis shows that Nepal is at very low debt distress, right? But that after that report has been published, Nepal has added another $500 billion to its total debt stock. And and in recent fiscal year or the past few years, we can see that major infrastructural projects like the two international airports have failed to generate any kind of revenue for the Nepali economy. And given that there has been delays in other infrastructural projects and like you said, choosing of wrong projects, delay in um, capital expenditure, low quality of expenditure. Can we still say that Nepal is at uh, low debt distress? Slice, you are right. There has been a rapid piling up of public debt. The World Bank um, IMF uh, debt sustainability assessment, uh, I think the latest one was carried out in 2023. I think it also says that Nepal's uh, risk of debt distress is low. And even if we look into some of the commonly thrown around thresholds, for instance, the Maastricht criteria of uh, 60% of uh, debt to GDP ratio and the famous uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff uh, ratio of 90% of um, debt to GDP ratio as being the threshold, However, we also need to note that not all is well with Nepal's public debt accumulation. Even the assessment which uh, said that Nepal's uh, risk of debt distress is low, it points out to some vulnerabilities. For instance, it points out that in two of its indicators, I think those were uh, the external debt to exports and debt service to exports. In those two thresholds, our values, um, they breach the sustainability threshold, which would mean a moderate risk of uh, debt distress. So it was only on the basis of good performance and other indicators like external, low external debt to GDP ratio, uh, low uh, external debt service to revenue ratio and unusually high level of remittances that uh, they use the judgment call to say that Nepal's uh, risk of uh, debt distress is low. And uh, even in their assessment, they point out that Nepal's uh, debt sustainability over the long term still hinges on uh, the right implementation of uh, the medium-term um, and, uh, debt framework uh, and the carrying out of necessary tax and spending reforms. So what all this means is we are not yet at a crisis level. 
But the way we are accumulating the public debt, and as you rightly pointed out, the infrastructure projects uh, that uh, incurred a significant share of government expenditure, they haven't been generating returns as envisaged. All these issues hint towards uh, the government needing to take a more cautious approach. But given the current level of debt and the composition of our debt and other factors, I think we are still not in a crisis situation. Thankfully, we've cleared that out. But given that we're graduating from our LDC status in 2026, that would mean we'll have to do away with certain type of concessional loans and maybe in the bilateral funds that we get, we'll maybe have to pay a higher interest rate, right? So so what are the long-term macroeconomic implications that LDC graduation can have specifically on public debt? Um, you rightly pointed out that um, LDC graduation may have some impacts, but... We are also witnessing another kind of graduation. What I mean is we recently graduated from World Bank's low income category to lower middle income category. That will also have consequence in terms of our access to concessional finance. So a lot of our concessional finance comes from uh, two multilateral institutions. World Bank in the ADB. And let's first talk about how we borrow from the World Bank. So basically, the World Bank has broadly two different types of funds that they lend. The first one is IBRD loans that they give to developing countries and low-income countries with good credit standing. And the ones we are, we borrow under is known as the IDA, International Development Assistant Concessional Credits. We haven't received any grants uh, since uh, 2015, given that uh, our um, debt repayment capacity is uh, robust. So under IDA credits, the World Bank categorizes country into two primary types. The first is called the regular category, and the second is called the IDA blend. The regular is the most concessional credit, and blend is slightly more expensive than the IDA regular category. So what determines what category Nepal would fall into is basically Nepal's uh, income in terms of GNI per capita and Nepal's credit worthiness. The World Bank sets an operational cutoff for the GNI level. So when a country breaches that cutoff, when its GNI per capita exceeds, exceeds that cutoff for two consecutive years, then those countries will be placed into what is known as the gap country category. And if a gap country category is deemed to have adequate credit worthiness, then they will move from the IDA regular category to IDA blend category. So Nepal is awfully close to that operational cutoff. So if Nepal breaches that cutoff for two consecutive years, which may happen in the very near, near future, what happens is Nepal risks moving into the IDA blend category. So if we move to the blend category, what, ha what will happen is we will pay an interest rate of 1.5% compared to no interest rate, and the commitment and service fees will still apply. And the amortization period will go down from 38 years to 30 years. So it's not a huge difference, but it does make a difference in terms of our the state of our concessional finance. And similar thing will happen in terms of our access to loan from the Asian Development Bank. Asian Development Bank also uses a similar categorization process where it bases its decision on the basis of the income label. It also uses the same operational cutoff used by the World Bank. And it also 
makes its assessment based on the credit worthiness. But LDC graduation will have an immediate impact when it comes to assessing the concessional finance from the Asian Development Bank. If we breach the operational cutoff, and if we are no longer an LDC, we move to what they call the OCR blend, the Ordinary Capital Resource Blend, which is expensive than the concessional only credit that we have been borrowing now. So we will definitely see some form of uh, loss in the concessionality nature of our external funds. And I think the impact is going to be modest in terms of our access to bilateral funds. But uh, reports point out that there might be some consequences in terms of borrowing from Japan, South Korea, Germany. They might prefer more loans than grants and the interest rates in the case of borrowing from Japan may go up once we graduate out of the LDC categories. And once we graduate and once our income rises, we may be tempted to borrow from the commercial sources when the sources of this concessional financing dries up, which have uh, their own challenges. Uh, And to sum up this question, we are very much dependent on remittances. So whenever there is any shock to remittances, then at some point uh, there will be uh, an impact on our ability to finance our external debt. So we need to be mindful of all these um, changes that are occurring. So to conclude, what are the policy measures that both in short term or long term the government of Nepal has to bring in so that we can cautiously tread the threshold line, the maybe, let's say, the Maastricht criteria of 60% debt-to-GDP ratio or lower, maybe. So what policy measures do you think? Uh, I think what makes it easier for us to suggest policy measures in the context of Nepal is the government is very open, very transparent about identifying and revealing its own problems. If you look at the midterm review of the budget implementation, you see all the problems uh, that are in that are happening in the area of public finance. So that makes it easier for us to recommend. So the first um, avenue for reform would definitely be in the area of enhancing institutional and regulatory reforms. We have to be able to better mobilize the foreign debts that are of concessional nature. And all of these require better public finance practices. So there is a need for enhancing the capacity of our public finance agencies. And the second point I would like to say is that, like it or not, our Development uh, future lies on the successful implementation of our newly adopted federal structure. So we have to make efforts towards enhancing the efficacy of our federal form of government, which requires better coordination among the different levels of government, enhancing capacity of subnational government to frame laws and to mobilize their resources properly, and also better clarity on the, the jurisdictions of each levels of the government. And the third one, reducing the wasteful expenditure, such as the social security expenditure, which has been growing at an expense. I am all for allowances for maintaining the social welfare of the country, but it has to be based on some form of scientific assessment and innovative solutions could be sought to perhaps target them better. Lastly, I think there is ample scope for us to improve our revenue collection by embarking on reforms in the inland tax area, by enhancing our tax and spending policies, I think we can better manage our public finance. Um, uh, As you've pointed out again and again, um, that Nepal is at a low debt distress and we do not have to panic right now. But any final thoughts to conclude on the episode? It has been a pleasure speaking with you in this podcast. Uh, So uh, 
in uh, when we look at the examples um, in the history, we see that sometimes uh, the public debt situation turns adverse very rapidly. So we definitely need to be more cautious of our public finance going forward. But there is no need to uh, panic about whether we are going to run into an immediate crisis. Thank you so much, Sitish, for joining us and sharing your interesting insights. Thanks for listening to Pods by PEI. I hope you enjoyed Ashlish's conversation with Chitiz on Nepal's public debt dilemma, opportunities and challenges. Today's episode was produced by me, Khushi, with support from Nirjan Rai and Ritesh Sapkota. The episode was recorded at PEI Studio and was edited by Ritesh Sapkota. Our theme music is courtesy of Rohit Shakir from Zindabad. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast. Also, Please do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show. For PEI's video-related content, please search for Policy Entrepreneurs on YouTube. To catch the latest from us on Nepal's policy and politics, please follow us on Twitter at Tweet2PEI. That's T-W-E-E-T, followed by the number 2 and P-E-I, and on Facebook at Policy Entrepreneurs, Inc. You can also visit PEI.Center to learn more about us. Thanks once again from me, Kushi. We will see you soon in our next episode.